You know, it's rare that everything you ever hear about a game is true, but I think Dragon's Dogma is one such case. It's too hard. It's too easy. Lack of fast travel is boring. Lack of fast travel is immersive. Chains and whips excite me. Wait, wait what? Chains and whips excite me. Yeah, I guess all that is true. Even as a longtime stan, I have to admit that despite its excellent spectacle of fighting huge monsters with exciting moves and its excellent Pokemon-like party system, Dragon's Dogma has a lot of peculiar features that make it an acquired taste for many. Despite becoming the fastest selling new IP of the seventh generation of consoles and selling over 8 million copies as of 2024, Dragon's Dogma remains a cult classic that's usually spoken of either with devotion or derision. <laughs> And while there are a lot more retrospectives on YouTube than I first imagined, I've certainly never been recommended them, nor have I heard anyone name drop the game in informal or industry talking head circles. Now, is there a good reason for that? Or is it still just one of gaming's best kept secrets? I think the answer is twofold. Yes, Dragon's Dogma has a lot going for it, but it does take a road less traveled and sometimes a treacherous one at that. It can certainly be a little contrived, arbitrary, and brutally difficult because it often goes against the immediate gratification or simplistic skill ceiling of its peers. Sometimes it's too much, but often it's just a very specific style that needs to be grasped in order to be appreciated. And don't worry, this is not a get good moment. No, my mission today is to convince you that Dragon's Dogma, despite its flaws, is way too cool a cat to just be an acquaintance that you hang out with every now and again, but someone you should get to know and probably grow old with. Lord knows Infinite New Game Pluses will make that super easy. Plus, there's a sequel coming out in March 2024, so I needed to get myself and you ready for it. So come with me, and let's get stuck in like a thousand kisses of an enchanted dagger, because as your pawns are keen to say, Strength in numbers arisen. The impending sequel to Dragon's Dogma, appropriately named Dragon's Dogma 2, gave me ample excuse to dive back into the original, but I never expected to find a pretty interesting dev cycle for a modern game in my research. You know, that's usually something reserved for the 90s classics, like Doom or Myst or Alone in the Dark. Games which did something great first and often have plenty of people asking how. But I guess Dragon's Dogma is 12 years old by now, so it's basically an antique. Dogma's concept is even older still, though, and took quite a while to gestate before coming to fruition. Dragon's Dogma began in the mind of one Hidaaki Itsuno many years ago. He was hired by Capcom back in 1994 and worked on many fighting games for them like Street Fighter Alpha and Capcom vs. SNK. But once development wrapped on Capcom vs. SNK around the year 2000, Itsuno's thoughts returned to an original RPG idea that he'd had since grade school and one which he'd created a design doc for in 2000. But as luck would have it, around that time, Itsuno's Capcom overlords weren't interested in him taking a break and politely demanded that he join the floundering Devil May Cry 2 dev team as its director. It's overblown how bad DMC2 is, it's honestly just painfully dull but its poor reception had Itsuno anxious to direct Devil May Cry 3 from start to finish and get a chance to get the bad taste out of his mouth. The glowing praise from DMC3 did the job, I'm sure, and he went on to direct Devil May Cry 4 before finally getting free enough to start pitching new IPs to Capcom in 2008. Itsuno had five diverse ideas that he'd been working on. Capcom's stipulation for accepting any of them was that whichever idea they chose, it needed to sell at least a million copies. God, which just sounds ridiculous to say. Remember when going platinum meant something instead of this bullshit now where you have to sell like eight to 10 million to be considered profitable with or you know, shut down your studio and fire all your team? <sighs> Back in my day, I guess. Anyway, Capcom initially balked at the scope and specificity of Itsuno's vision for Dragon's Dogma. His pawn system was a little too abstract in theory, and this was the first open world game that Capcom had considered making. Open world RPGs had only recently had a major hit in 2006's Oblivion, and Fallout 3 and Fable 2 wouldn't be out until October 2008, a full five months after Itsuno's pitch. I guess it just had to be this bitch in animation demo that got the project greenlit. I mean, <laughs> come on. Okay, not exactly, though the animation tech was a big reason why the game was doable, but the most important factor was Itsuno's assurance that they'd stay within Capcom's budget, which I'm sure made all the suits super happy. 
And what also made them happy was his emphasis on bringing the frenetic action of DMC3's Dante and Nero fights to the RPG space. And with Demon's Souls releasing a year later in 2009, and of course the Dark Souls phenomenon still three years away, Dogma was poised to fill a role in the fantasy RPG space that most probably didn't even know how much they wanted yet. So Itsuno took his rather large 200-person team, 150 of which worked on DMC4, and got to work. Haro Murata wrote the main quest and numerous side quests, and realized that after fighting a cyclops at the end of a demo dungeon crawl, that he wanted the story to feel reactive to the player and also suitably epic, while also being subtle in how the story wraps itself around the player and doesn't beat them over the head with how their decisions are having incremental consequences as they go. Breath of Fire designer Makoto Ikihara also helped the team early on to establish the lore of Dragon's Dogma, from what characters and cultures needed to exist to be realistic and provide interesting quest opportunities. Itsuno also said that Dungeons and & Dragons and the never-ending story were big influences too, but he was also really keen to make something in the vein of what he called the prototypical fantasy storyline in The Lord of the Rings, which he respected very much. And based on how much juicy goblin combat is in the game and how the Cyclops look and act a lot like the trolls in Peter Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring and how sticky the daggers and swords feel, I'd say he did Tolkien and Peter Jackson proud. It's also really important to note just how much Western influence Itsuno and the company went for here. Despite the fantasy setting, Dogma is decidedly reminiscent of real places in world history, its fictional Duchy of Granzas being modeled after trips the team made to Europe. Granzas ended up evoking the Mediterranean glory of Sicily's stone architecture and rocky beach-laden geography. Itsuno and producer Hiroyuki Kabayashi of RE1 and Dino Crisis fame were certainly dedicated to the action and spectacle, but they were also committed to making the fantastic feel even more affecting because it was happening in a truly believable place. Now, before I give Capcom all the credit here, I do want to note the likelihood that a lot of it is probably inspired by the medieval European stylings used by the Berserk anime and manga, with its lords and ladies and knights and castles. Dragon's Dogma even made Guts and Griffith's armors purchasable from an in-game vendor, so Berserk was clearly near and dear to the team's hearts. And I'll be sure to point out any other Berserk references as we go, because there are plenty. <laughs> But as for how Dragon's Dogma made these influences its own, much work was done to include real-world cultures too, like the French-influenced African accent of Mason or the Persian vibes of some outfits. An Ombla prize to be sure, but at least he's talkative. And while it looks very much like the Mediterranean, the people and places who inhabit Grancis are distinctly medieval in their speech patterns, dress, and customs, where you can look just about anywhere and find knights with bad Prince Valiant hair wearing bulging armor and coats of arms. You can see them participating in duels and fiefdom and saying weird things like ought and for truth. This your handiwork? For truth? Localization specialist Aaron Ellis said that because all the dialogue was being recorded in English, they had little freedom to experiment with the dialect, and they ended up choosing a flowery medieval English to be as high a speech as the rest of the high fantasy. She cites George R.R. R. Martin as an inspiration, which I find kind of funny since I'm pretty sure his favorite word is fuck or something, not forsooth. It's also kind of funny that despite this English-only focus, the facial animations and lip-syncing are often horrifyingly bad. Regardless, though, the voice acting is pretty solid, and the script's floweriness is amusingly dorky and endearing. Still, it is more agreeable than the endlessly dour air of most of my husband's son swords. Now, the real stars of the sound production are the score and musical stingers. Initially, there was this hard rock tinge to everything, but Itsuno and company gradually realized that the setting was better supported by an orchestral score that propped up the gameplay from the background in quiet moments, granting it a lighter-than-air quality. Now, of course, the game can get bumping during combat, you know, with some incredibly dramatic chanting. So much so that my wife comes from two rooms over and shuts my door so she can read in peace, but... <laughs> That's the price of being epic, and I'll pay it gladly. I am impressed. The main theme is also utterly beautiful and catchy, and the bells that sound out in this track and throughout the game, even when leaving the menus to come back into the game, feel like a callback to fantasy, to imagination. The vibes are just so strong in Dragon's Dogma, even when little jazzy electric guitar fills come in during classical music moments. All the cultural pageantry and geography of the game is distinctly Japanese in its campiness and over-the-topness, yet authentically interested in the people and places it's cobbling together from afar into this pleasingly anachronistic alternate reality. 
The structure of the places these cultures collide in is supremely interesting to me as well. It's soon have said in his GDC talk that the initial map size of Granzas was twice as large as the final game and was level gated. In fact, at one point, the actual factual moon was a destination that you could go to, providing you were level 80. Now, when was the last time, besides that level in Wolfenstein The New Order, you could play on the moon? I love Japanese developers, man. They will do fucking anything. I mean, I'd love them more if they kept the moon in the game, but hey, that's what the sequels are for, right? Right? Anyway. Back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. The initially uber-large island became a peninsula instead, meaning a landmass mostly, but not completely surrounded by water on its edges. Personally, I describe the world design as consisting of lanes, much like Metal Gear Solid 5. It's never a truly flat plane where, you know, anything you can see, you can go to like the Elder Scrolls. And I wouldn't say exploration does a ton to reward you other than just provide some off the beaten path monster fights. As such, Dragon's Dogma can feel quite curated and intentional in its construction, providing important destinations with more gravitas as you're asked to return to them over and over. It also makes exploration kind of frustrating when you realize that you often can't go everywhere in a certain location until you've initiated a quest somewhere down the line that lets you get to that one extra room and see the treasure or fight the boss at the end. But we'll talk more about that later when we get into quests. Okay, so we've talked about the world's features, so let's go into the story that takes place within it. You play as a no-name protagonist with little backstory other than you live in a small fishing village and have a BFF named Kina. One fine day, your idyllic existence is rudely interrupted by an attacking dragon named Grigori, who just sort of picks you at random to be deleted. Yay you! He plucks your heart out of your chest and basically just says something to the effect of, Come at me, bro. Miraculously, you're able to oblige him by resurrecting with a deep scar in your chest. You have now become what's called an Arisen, a title bestowed to those whom this has happened to and who must now hunt down this unruly winged lizard and get your revenge as well as your heart back. Along the way, you'll fight tons of monsters, explore, and carry out quests in classic RPG fashion. But you're not alone in your travels, and that's where Dragon's Dogma's major innovation comes into play. You soon find that one of the perks of being a rather decent-looking zombie of sorts is that the Arisen have access to the Rift, a nexus of realities that connects you to other parallel dimensions where humanoids called pawns can be summoned to aid your quest. These guys are essentially androids whose AI behavior you can tweak and whose sole purpose is to aid you. You get to create one of your own that's with you always and can be resummoned indefinitely at Rift Stones, and you're allowed up to two others that are rented from other players' games using Rift Crystals to pay for them. You and your pawn both get created using a nicely detailed character creation tool where you can modify your scars, your voice to comical effect, and even make them look crazy big or small, which actually nets you more carrying weight or health or lets you reach higher places if you're a big person. Or conversely, you can fit into small holes for shortcuts or have more magic but less health and damage output. It's great that these choices matter, and there's a lot of them to make. There's even a Reddit forum called DDDA Sliders, where people ask for experienced character creators to create their favorite characters as best they can inside of this tool. And once you're done with the aesthetics, you can make you and your pawn out to be one of three basic starting classes or vocations, as they're called in Dragon's Dogma. They're the classic three archetypes that you've seen a hundred thousand times, and that's the fighters who use sword and shield to taunt and tank enemies, striders who use traps, daggers and bows, and mages who are typically providing buffs and debuffs to exploit enemy elemental weaknesses or healing the team without having to use curatives. And as you complete quests and gain XP, these unlock discipline points that translate into skill buying currency. These skills are hot keyable abilities that range from buffs to outright badass looking things you might have to perform a combo to do in Devil May Cry. And they often need to be charged up to work or have different levels of effectiveness based on how much you've charged them. No matter your vocation though, almost all special abilities draw from the stamina meter, and that's the only real limit on how you wish to build your character out. Other than of course the currency that you have to buy the abilities in the first place. While this all sounds fairly conventional, the fact that you get such a wide variety of offensive and defensive capabilities, and weird ones like Magic Rebalancer that boost your party's magic and can be stacked up to four times, means you have an incredible variety of combat roles to fulfill. But where things get absolutely mental is how the game lets you play hybrid vocations after hitting level 10. These include the Mystic Knight, Magic Archer, and Sorcerer. Have you ever played the card game Munchkin and gotten a Super Munchkin card that let you have two classes equipped at once, all the strengths of both? Well, that's essentially what Dragon's Dogma lets you do with the advanced vocations. These feel like getting the best of two worlds at once, and you can freely switch between them and any other vocations at hubs if you have the discipline currency to do so and would like to experiment. Now, of course, you're incentivized to stick with one and keep building it up to level up that particular vocation. 
But even if you are switching around, you unlock augments as you level that provide static buffs like improved magic if you're close to death or extra stamina and many others. So you can start mixing and matching augments and abilities that can be shared by a family of vocations like say the ranger, strider, and magic archer vocations. Now I first played as a strider, which is something I hardly ever do in RPGs, but the ability to be either melee or ranged was absolutely indispensable in this game and the extremely high DPS of the class just sold me on it. Now this vocation eventually unlocked the ranger which dealt in longbows and daggers and eventually i unlocked what many agree to be the best class in the game the magic archer it's certainly the most fun you get magic arrows at this point and some absolutely filthy abilities like sixfold shot and magic rebalancer which buffs anyone's magic inside it to really boost your damage output now I tried Sorcerer as well on my New Game Plus playthrough recently, but I wasn't super impressed. Now the abilities like the Lightning Whip are often really cool and effective, but many just took way too long to charge up and I got easily interrupted quite a bit. And most of the abilities have high variance damage anyway, so pff, it doesn't always work out very well. I'd like to turn the floor over now to Baldy, who's a big friend of the channel, who has a similar experience with the vocations to relate. I'm a back of the pack guy taking chip shots at range with arrows or magic spells while my teammates wreck havoc up front. Naturally, my first class was ranger. My favorite, I think, was called Tenfold Arrow, which launched 10 arrows at once. It was quite overpowered and I was thrilled to spam that sucker as often as I could. Naturally, there was a sniper arrow attack too, offering more damage in exchange for a slower draw time. Another cool attack would tie enemies in place. Done properly, you could stick a few foes to the ground and your pawns could hammer them into oblivion. I thought there was another attack, like I want to say launching arrows up in the air and then they rain down in a nice AOE move, but I might be mistaken. He ain't lying. I tried to utilize the assassin build, but it wasn't for me. That class saw the melding of fighter and strider. I thought it was the worst of each class instead of the best, but in the end I couldn't make it work efficiently enough to keep going at it. I think had the game offered true co-op with other human players, I could have done much more with the other classes. Now interestingly, while co-op is generally just always better to have than not in just about everything, the pawn system is its own distinct brand of enjoyment. So like we saw before, they can be created much like your risen character, but are limited to the major three archetypes and can't be mystic knights or magic archers or sorcerers, but they're an inextricable part of Dragon's Dogma's allure. Itsuno was first inspired by the bulletin board system or BBS of the old school 80s and 90s internet forums. He remembers posting and getting responses back to be a really fun exchange and translated that high into how pawn creation was a form of self-expression that you could share with others for use in their game. This concept was a hard sell at first because mobile phones and instant messaging and social games weren't common in the aughts and therefore the convenience of use that the pawns represented wasn't nearly as easy to prove by example. What else would you expect with my help? Pawns were initially called custom mercenary character, which makes some sense because you hire out other people's pawns like mercenaries. And while you're always offline while playing, the game will check a server when you rest at hubs and update you with any gifts and ratings that other players gave to your pawn while they were renting them out, if any did so. So you're basically creating a Pokemon that can be shared around the world with other players and impact their success based on how well you crafted this pawn. They can also have their AI behavior tweaked to be more aggressive or more protective of you and many other variables to make them more effective per your desire. So while I get Baldi's desire for traditional co-op and that would be why the MMO version of Dragon's Dogma Online would surface in 2015, I do think the pawns as is are pretty fun. They're highly customizable and a little unpredictable even in combat and it makes them feel alive. Oh, and they never shut up and are always learning like grown-ass children. They're often handing out banal info like wolves hunt in packs and goblins are weak to fire, sometimes to the detriment of your sanity. Wolves hunt in packs. Oh, you're right, Master. It is a land rife with spots where useful to see it. Let's fight and see what they do. Slip me, target. Shut up! Shut up! But Baldi, despite his misgivings about some of the pawn configurations, actually has some great insight on how their speed round trivia actually matters to the gameplay. A great trick the game did was bringing over knowledge. I remember my friend's character as he cleared a temple once. I borrowed his pawn and his pawn said out loud something like, Sire, I believe I've been here before. We should find an entrance up on the roof. And sure enough, there's an easier path up there. They'd also bring over loot or gear into your world. And in turn, I could send them back any gear that I didn't need. It was awesome, a neat way to replicate what we do in co-op or in real life. Like, hey, I found something cool. I'm not specced for a giant two-hand sword, so maybe you can use it and sell it if not. 
It was a blast. Word, Mr. Baldy. Thank you very much. Now, I'm somebody who also really values having a cool party of folks to adventure with. It's my favorite thing about classic Bioware franchises like Dragon Age Origins or Mass Effect, and something I greatly miss in the Fallout or Elder Scrolls series when I only get the one follower, because it just makes the game come alive with a sense of camaraderie and a little unpredictability. I still think Dragon's Dogma's greatest innovation is its unorthodox commitment to essentially making your party full of Pokemon, and it's the thing I'm the most interested in seeing the sequel approve upon and iterate on, which we'll talk about a little bit more at the end of the video. Okay, so that's a lot of bells and whistles talk, but let's get down to business and focus on the action and the action RPG and how you and your pawns generally spend most of your time clashing with monsters and working together on the battlefield. The reward of the action is often in recognizing its depth versus just in the feedback of moment to moment gameplay. For instance, many attack animations don't account for hitting another object in the middle of them, so once they make contact with another object, they kind of awkwardly slide or drag across them like they're not really clanging with them, they're just sort of getting stuck on them a little bit, and it looks pretty awkward at times. But the sound effects try their damnedest to sell the carnage, and there are so many cool abilities like being able to hover as a mage or double jump as an archer, or rain hundreds of blows on your opponents with daggers or swarms of arrows, you're not going to have to look far to make the action look good again. The idea of the action looking cinematic and good up close came from their work on Devil May Cry, but producer Hiroyuki Kabayashi said that the open world nature of the game prompted the team to come up with the idea that the big creatures who could fit there would be able to be as freely interacted with as the world was to traverse. This meant grabbing onto and scaling enemies to hit their weak spots. And you've got quite a roster of baddies here to grapple onto, from flying harpies that dive bomb you to big lizards with spears that need to have their tails lopped off to weaken them, to cyclops and trolls and chimeras, which are kind of the poster child for Dragon's Dogma. Pretty much all can be grabbed and hacked at, and finding enemy weaknesses is usually intuitive and pretty fun to exploit. The Chimera's three heads can be attacked individually and worn down, and taking the snake tail off first removes its most lethal extremity, making it substantially easier to deal with. The Cyclops is weak to eye damage, as you'd imagine, and many later incarnations of this creature wear armor on their face so that they're hard to damage, and you've really got to wear that armor down before you're able to stagger them. There's a lot of this depth and contextual sensitivity, and that's not even including how most enemies have elemental or status effect weaknesses. Cyclops are really weak to ice damage for whatever reason, which makes the giant icicle ability you make that gouges them in the eye look like it really hurts as it melts their health bar, and the meteor shower really makes short work of chimeras. It's a really decent system, and there's often a physical marker or two that give you an idea of how to attack enemies and what they'll be weak to. Dragons, for instance, have big glowing hearts you need to target, and enemies coated in capital D, Dark Energy, will be weak to holy damage, and any holy creatures are weak to dark energy, and so on and so forth. This is the most apparent in the Bitter Black Isle expansion that came with the 2017 Dark Arisen version of the game. Most enemies there are dark based and thus weak to holy damage, except the Dark Bishop or the Zombie Pope or whatever you want to call him, who is not weak to holy because of his religious affiliation. An interesting twist but we'll get into that expansion more specifically later on. But needless to say, there's a lot of moving parts in how you figure out the best way to take down your enemies. This level of depth and required attention to detail plays perfectly into an RPG's interest in tactics and resource management, like how you balance your stamina bar and curatives and how you prepare for fights. Now, anytime a game gets this detail oriented, I always have fun asking this question, is this game an immersive sim? Now, of course, it's not in the strict sense, but it shares so many great details of the genre and of games like Ultima Underworld. I just want to hyper-focus on all the great detail that most RPGs eschew, but Capcom felt was intrinsic to making Dragon's Dogma a special experience. You can grab enemies and scale them for specific high damage attacks, or just to keep yourself from getting run over on the ground, and you can also grab explosive barrels and use them to set traps or for good bursts of damage when thrown. There's a persistent day and night cycle as well that will affect the food that you're carrying as the days go by, meaning it can spoil if you don't eat it soon enough. Nighttime also brings out more enemies and harder ones at that, which I believe, if memory serves, gain you more XP for defeating. NPCs operate on their own timetables around these night and day cycles and are often only available either in morning or at night, meaning you'll have to either wait around or sleep for them to appear. Any physical makeup you have will conversely have a weakness. 
Big characters may be able to carry more and deal more damage, but they can't squeeze into small spaces and their magic is weak, while small people can access little hidey hole shortcuts and have better magic, but can't reach high places or deal as much damage. There are a ton of immersive cause and effect considerations to be had here, and while I'm not claiming Dragon's Dogma is an immersive sim and its design philosophy on the whole, it is far more reactive and interactive than the average action game or RPG normally is, at least in the modern age. The world itself is set up to be very manual, very literal in what things that you want to have done, you have to do them. This stands in stark contrast to games like the recent Skull and Bones. It used to be that when you boarded ships in Assassin's Creed Black Flag, that you would have to jump onto the ship manually and fight the pirates and then take over the ship. In Skull and Bones, however, you just click a button to board the ship and finish out the fight when the ship's health is low enough. Dragon's Dogma wants you to get your hands dirty. As I said, the map is set up in lanes, meaning there's lots of roads to follow that lead to landmarks, with some but not an over much amount of exploration to be done off the beaten path. But even this streamlined approach can be trying because while you can pick up port crystals in the world and set them down to return here via fast travel, the fairy stone items that allow fast travel in the first place used to be one-time use only, meaning you had to be very judicious about using them, and you often ended up walking most places anyway, fighting the same tired trash mobs over and over to get to your destination. It wasn't until Dark Arisen came out in 2017 that an eternal fairy stone was added to the game that allowed for infinite uses, greatly reducing but certainly not eliminating the tedium of travel. What will never make much sense to me is why running drains your stamina so much, or at all. You're sprinting everywhere for miles at a time, and that often means you'll run your stamina bar dry, then have to stop and wait for it to fill back up before continuing. My level 77 character runs out of stamina on the shortest road in the entire game, from Casardus to the encampment. You can basically see the end of the path, and that path is still enough to drain your entire stamina bar. So, <clears throat> geez. This means that if you're adventuring off-road, you can easily be caught off guard by monsters and have no stamina left to use for your abilities, ending in your swift death because you know, you've been using it to run. The game doesn't drain your stamina if you're running around hubs, but it really shouldn't do it outside of combat at all because it makes an already arduous travel process even more painful. And since we're talking quests and how long they take to be completed, let's examine the three main quest varieties. Notice board quests, side quests, and main story quests. Notice board quests are essentially just challenges like kill 10 of this monster or escort this person super far across the world and hope they don't die or you fail. Nobody really likes escort missions, but these are quite the pain because there's so many of them. None of them are interesting and you often your escort will die at the last possible moment when you're about 20 minutes out in the landscape and something just one shots them out of nowhere, wasting your time. The notice board quests are really just barely justifiable excuses to grind out XP and kind of naturally get done a lot of the time as you're just doing other things and killing monsters. Point being, the side quests are generally pretty boring, with a few exceptions. So the main brunt of the story is that after you survive Gregoria's attack, you run into hot Frenchy knight Sir Mercedes and impress her by killing an attacking Hydra. Also note that killing the Hydra reminds me a lot of how Guts beheads the Master in one of the anime's first episodes, and how much Sir Mercedes looks and acts like a meeker version of Casca from Berserk down to her complexion, short cape, and also how she's constantly fighting to be taken seriously in a male-dominated space. And once you've impressed Mercedes, I am impressed. As a reward, ha ha ha, you get to escort the slain Hydra head to the Duke of Grancis, Edmund Dragonsbane, who got his title years ago from defeating a dragon. He also resembles the king that employs the Band of the Hawk in Berserk quite a bit. He's interested in helping you defeat the dragon yet again and asks for your help in solving his problems around the kingdom, including the salvation cult of necromancers who appear to worship the dragon Grigori and welcome his destruction of humanity. Now, we'll get into story spoilers soon, but the bulk of the story missions involve solving some big problems around Granzis like these. One really cool intersection of side quest and the main quest is when you get an otherwise simple job from a guy named Stefan who wants you to find the lost grimoire from a legendary sorcerer. You go way far out, grab it, bring it back to him and get your reward, and go your merry way. Hours later, I was given a task in the main story to hunt down and contain a griffin, which is one of the best missions in the game, and it required me to grab a goblin and throw it into a little glowing zone as bait to make the griffin come down in epic fashion. We pursued the griffin across the land to a huge tower for a final showdown, and who should show up to help us but Stefan with his new grimoire? He ends up putting that shit to work, firing lightning bolts right and left, and we triumph. It was great. 
In another instance, we run into the sketchy Forneval, a shady businessman who wants our help to evict his tenants who can't afford his recently superinflated rent. We can try to convince them to leave, but the night and day cycle made it hellacious to find one of the people I needed to talk to. And so I was just about to move on, but one of my pawns suggested that we should just buy the land right out at its inflated cost so the tenants could stay, solving everyone's problem. And we did so and found out later that the Duke had Forneval on his radar as a corrupt man already. We end up collecting evidence with which to pardon or convict him, and this finishes out this unobtrusive but substantial little mini-arc. This is when Dragon's Dogma favorably recalls the first two Witcher games, where side quests would oftentimes lean on the main quest and sort of reflect consequences back and forth onto each other until they resolve the major arcs. The main story of Dragon's Dogma is also pretty solid, just in general, if a little straightforward and short, but we'll soon get to what makes it really good here in spoiler territory. For now, let's back up to those finicky quest markers I mentioned. There were many times when no quest marker would arise, no pun intended, and this seemed to be by design, only by happening to realize that there was something called Chronicle in the menu that summarizes the story mission so far, could I often intuit where to go next to shake loose the next story quest, but this wasn't always successful and there wasn't always a clue as to what to do next. This in combination with how the night and day cycle make people unavailable really just plays havoc with your ability to know where to go and what to do, and a fair few times it felt like quests were breaking and being incompletable or at least incredibly elusive. One time a guy never showed up again whether it was day or night, and one time a person I was escorting just simply disappeared and I could never find them again. And as much as people call this an action RPG, it's really more of a hero action game with some story and dialogue rather than a choice-laden branching storylines role that you're playing. Now, Dragon's Dogma does have some agency in quest completion. It's really more about tactile feedback than any political or moral agency. For instance, on two separate occasions, I was allowed to spare a Salvation member that I'd captured. I let one guy go, but he was immediately killed by my contact, Mason who then told me that he couldn't work with me anymore if I didn't have the guts to do what must be done. So the outcome was the same regardless of what I chose. Another cult member I let go showed up later in a catacomb and had a scripted death there too without offering anything in terms of reward or narrative intrigue for me letting him go in the first place. That's not to say the main quest is bad or just rigid, but the illusion of choice is kind of real here in a couple places, and I'm not really sure why it was included at all. It's like there are feints at depth here when the story really wanted to do a classically linear JRPG narrative, not some Witcher-esque, totally different chapter endings type of deal based on what you pick. All that to say, the quests are pretty much all well voice acted, the direction of the story cutscenes and the cinematography are dramatic and sweeping and just cool. And to be honest with you, I can't really hold it in any longer. Let's get into spoilers, because Dragon's Dogma's story starts simply and innocently enough and then goes absolutely bonkers by the end. So as you're handling business for the Duke, you find out his chief wife, chief wife, you find out his child wife, Eleanor, has the hots for you because the Duke is possessed or an asshole or, you know, just 30 years her senior. But when the Duke finds you and Eleanor off by yourselves, he goes into a mad rage and almost kills her before his wrath is allayed by her saying, you came on to her, getting you flogged and jailed. Thanks a lot, bitch. I couldn't re quite remember how you got out and got into his good graces again. And I realized reading an article today that you don't. You just get a key, you unlock the gate, walk right past the guard in the cell, he does absolutely nothing. And then you come back to the throne room as if nothing happened. <laughs> How's that for some good ass writing? Unfortunately, this whole arc is just underdeveloped, creepy, and uncomfortable, and just smacks of either some inappropriate fetish or a completely uncommitted stab at edgy storytelling. It's also extra creepy since the Duke and Eleanor seem like a perversion of the father-daughter relationship of the very similar looking king and his daughter Charlotte from Berserk, who's wearing almost the exact same pink dress that Eleanor is in the game. But thankfully, this goes away before long and you can get back to the good stuff. One of the absolute best fucking parts of the game is recapturing a castle from what appears to be goblins but turns out to be much worse. There's a huge battlefield with ballistas firing from overhead as you and the Duke's men take on an army of goblins and the two cyclopses that aid them. It's incredibly epic, like a downsized two towers battle, and you can even go up on the ramparts and return ballista fire to help your guys out so they're not getting pinned down. Another mission has you recapturing the Great Wall from the Salvation Cult, and you fight two undead whites atop the tower there as well. Then, just like that, the cult is basically written out of the story too. 
Their leader, the Elysian, gives a grandiose speech about welcoming the destruction the dragon brings, and then just gets deleted with abandon by Gregory in hilarious fashion. This is absolute truth! This is salvation! And that's the last you hear of these guys. You never really learn much about them except that they really like the dragon and they really like resurrecting dead people. The same undercookedness applies to Salome or Salamet the Sorcerer, whose grimoire you found earlier for Stefan. Salome reappears in a quest for the Duke as something of a highwayman, but despite his cool deep voice and reputation in the game world, he's so easily defeated that the boss battle can barely begin. Let us be done with this. All this stuff in combination with the weird Eleanor side plot just makes Dragon's Dogma feel like it has so many ideas it either didn't know what to do with or just couldn't find the budget or time to develop further. The good news though is that once you clear out Salvation, things start to get wild really quickly and trend towards what I like most about Dragon's Dogma, which is its lore. After Salvation is defeated and Grigori sort of gives you an ultimatum like this is going to be a big deal and this is a momentous occasion for you, come find me. You end up going to the Dragon Forged, a cryptic arisen from the olden days that seems to be a repository of various dragon-related knowledge. He lets you know that this whole dragon showdown involves a choice that you must make soon, and when you arrive at the top of the Tainted Mountain, the choice is whether to let the dragon do what he wills and offer up your beloved as a sacrifice. Your beloved is the character with the highest affinity towards you in the game, and which you'll have pulled off through either doing the most favored quests for them or giving them gifts. Grigori asks whether humanity, despite all its creative endeavors to build cities and birth new generations, is in any kind of control over its fate, or whether it's all just vanity. We eat when hungry, and we sleep when tired of eating. We kill them as we want them dead. Their kind is easy to fathom. They go on from simple fear of death. But is humanity any different, Grigori asks? Salvation embraces him, but many like the Arisen stand up to him. Abandon all delusions of control, he says. Does all this talk about fate and the will and lack of self-control sound familiar? I think it sounds an awful lot like the classic intro to Berserk episodes. In this world, is the destiny of mankind controlled by some transcendental entity or law? Is it like the hand of God hovering above? At least it is true that man has no control, even over his own will. So once Grigori has intimated that man is only so much in control over his destiny, and rather that his destiny controls him, he reveals that he's offered this compromise to Duke Edmund Dragon's Bane as well, who's wrongfully claimed that he killed a dragon all those years ago and has sat in power ever since due to Grigori's deal. Now if you take Grigori's deal, you'll get the same reward. If you accept, you see yourself briefly as the Duke, but then get a game over screen. So you have to try again and stand up to him this time. What follows is a really harrowing set piece. Oh, and can I just say how wonderful David Lodge's voice acting is here as Grigori? It's so crispy and cool and scary. Now remember this when we talk later about the Dragon's Dogma anime and how it handles Grigori. But anyway, back to the game proper. If you can deal enough damage, you can actually defeat Grigori in the castle, but most players will have to chip away at him and then have to follow him up the mountain and dodge his swooping attacks as you go. You even get to grab a hold of his back and have to hack away until he drops you into the final arena, which has several ballistas, which is weirdly reminiscent of Dragon Age Origins ending. Grigori animates very well here, but this isn't the most interesting fight ever devised, though it's you know nicely balanced and not too difficult, and you get to hear his badass banter back and forth. Eventually, you outlast him and win the day. Or will you? His death rocks the mountain, splitting it in half, and nearby in Grand Soren, an earthquake swallows half the town. The dragon forged evaporates, and the duke ages many years in an instant, the source of his power now gone. Gregoria's death is a hollow victory in the end, revealing an infection instead of curing a disease. You meet with the Duke, who ironically accuses you of accepting the dragon's bid and stealing his power, but that's because he's still operating under the assumption that killing the dragon had an obviously good consequence or non-selfish end, unlike his did. The next couple of missions are great fun because they subvert the idea that killing the dragon in a hero's journey is all there is at the end. No, in fact, you've now got to descend down into the Everfall, a realm related to the Rift and Pawns. 
One pawn named Quince tasks you with continuing her former mistress's work to acquire 20 wake stones, which you take on for some reason. But basically what this sets up is a kind of repetitive boss rush where you go through about 16 tiers or so to get all the wake stones that you need. And the entire time you're doing this, there's only like two interiors to choose from. So it just keeps swapping back and forth, back and forth, and just goes on for forever. They also appear to be randomly generated as one time I entered a nearly impossible one with two chimeras, the hardest non-boss enemies in the hell hounds and a dark bishop and then came back again to find it populated with trash mobs instead. This goes on for far too long, but once you're done with this arbitrary task, you'll be able to descend into the heart of the Everfall to uncover your true destiny as an Arisen. Here in a barren plain with only a throne in its midst, we meet the Seneschal. He reveals to us that he is the previous Arisen, that he is the Demiurge, the god of Dragon's Dogma. The dragon picks the Arisen to sort of go through a hero's journey because he represents the obstacles of life that everyone must face, the evils we must contend with from within and without to achieve enlightenment, to better ourselves against our flaws. To do anything less than strive to live is to make oneself like the pawns, without aim or emotion beyond childlike devotion to whomever they become allied to. This whole journey has been essentially a grand illustration of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey in the abstract, you and the dragon merely pawns in a divine game. In killing the dragon within you, so to speak, you now rule over yourself, and now you will take this Arisen's place as the ruler of this world. By depersonalizing the narrative into this sort of these grand concepts that would make Carl Jung or Friedrich Nietzsche proud, Capcom actually made the narrative even more personally memorable to me, but there's even more still. Before the multiverse was on the minds of DC and Marvel and Alan Wake, Dragon's Dogma proposed a mini-worlds theory of its own, that all of creation is multiple worlds, multiple realities stacked on top of each other, and this is how the pawns are able to be pulled between worlds. Not only that, but the world is looping around and around on itself, an eternal cycle of death and rebirth, of downfall into ascension, the world trading out its god as it goes. It's not a spiral, it is a loop, unlike Alan Wake 2, but the concept is certainly similar and shares that eternal return concept that Signalis leaned into as well, which is the Zoroastrian idea that Nietzsche repopularized, that all life is set in stone and that time never really ends but keeps looping in barely discernible variations. Dragon's Dogma has one more surprise still. You take the God's Bane sword from the Seneschal and kill him with it to release him from his post as God of this world and become the new Seneschal yourself. But in a final, unprecedented act of individuality, you decide to turn the blade on yourself and end the cycle without a new Arisen being there to succeed you. You and your pawn fall from heaven to the shores of Casardus where the game began. Everywhere I've read says that because only the player character emerges from the water and looks surprised at how their body is, that this means that the pawn now occupies your old body, as your spirit has vacated this plane of existence just like the last Seneschal did. Your beloved comes to you, well, the pawn, and says everything's changed, and then the pawn, perhaps now human for the first time, breaks the fourth wall with a sage nod to the camera and turns back as the sun sets on what is a new beginning, a new game plus you'll likely start playing but one without a god, in theory, because the game technically still ends exactly the same every time, so it doesn't really account for there not being a god anymore. It's not entirely clear what the moral implications are of God being dead, like Nietzsche said, but as a metaphysical thought experiment, it's extremely cool and fun to consider, even if it is just an original iteration on the time loop and hero's journey concepts. That's pretty cool stuff, isn't it? It's pretty cool, I guess. But there's one aspect of Dragon's Dogma's narrative that we haven't touched on that could be relevant to the sequel as well, and that's the extra content present in 2017's re-release of Dragon's Dogma called Dark Arisen. This section offers up a brand new elongated dungeon crawl with some new enemies and some really hard versions of old ones and a bunch of really tough boss fights. One of the end bosses, Daemon, also seems to be a really cool homage to Nosferatu Zod from Berserk. Tell me this guy and this piece of artwork don't scream Dragon's Dogma in the Arisen's heart. You'll fight minotaurs, giant exploding undead, and even the terrifying personification of death that'll haunt you periodically like Mr. X. There's clearly a lot of Dark Souls influence here, as this did come out, you know, six years after that game did, and it kind of feels like an extended Blight Town or Tomb of the Giants section, what with all the afflictions, flesh-eating worms, trap chests, and extended amounts of darkness. It's also brutally fucking difficult. <laughs> At level 70, my pawns were getting killed right and left. I tried to speed run my way through the tough areas by running to the exit door and teleporting the pawns to me when we loaded into the next area, but often they got knocked down too quickly and I didn't have time to go back and revive them. 
I even tested to see if the game was just in balance regardless of difficulty. And sure enough, even turning the difficulty down to easy, it was still foolishly difficult. And this is with me and my pawn wearing Dark Arisen specific gear that was Dragon Forged after killing Grigori and was by far and away better than all the other gear I had, namely the Voldaren armor and the set of Queen's clothing. I even used Magic Rebalancer and all that to boost magic damage output, which is like the, the pro tip that you're supposed to use for Magic Archer. Now most everything down here is weak to holy damage, being dark creatures and all that, but so many other resistances exist like super high damage resist on the living armors and dark bishop, and other such things. Many enemies have an almost constant ability to stack knockdowns so you can oftentimes never get up. What I'm finding is that I probably need to come back after another new game plus to have any chance, but even that seems kind of unlikely to matter if I'm level 70, have played through the game twice, and still can't hang with these pieces of shit. Checkpoints are also terrible down here. The game tries to have this one arisen follow you around to stock up from from time to time, but it can't change your vocation or purify the cursed super loot that you find down here to really improve your chances, so he's only marginally helpful. Only the lady that brought you here at the top level can do these things. Your pawns dying constantly obviously made progression very hard, but even more so when the Rift Stones and Black Bitter Isle are all broken and they require a really large amount of Rift Crystals to mend. But the cost of resources is way higher than you'll generally accrue that I could really only mend one of them. Eventually, I just could justify the expenditure of preposterously bullet sponge enemies with hyper-specific weaknesses that you have to dive into wikis for and can't find out in-game, and I just called it quits. I think the game assumes that you're going to farm the lower tier bosses over and over to get strong enough for the later ones, you know, and if that's so fine I guess, that's a choice, but it's unlikely that you'd even know they're respawning till days later and better yet, is that fun enough to be worth doing over and over again? Unlikely. I mean I had a little fun with the first big gazer boss once I figured out that you could jump on his face and cut his eye up, but even this took forever and oftentimes my guy who just wouldn't grab a hold of him would fall splat on his face just about killing himself, so that was fun. So yeah, this seems like a good place to transition into why people may bounce off Dragon's Dogma like I did the floor. Why it remains a cult classic instead of a household name despite selling millions of copies. The story ends up being pretty interesting despite its sometimes unfocused nature, music's wonderful, combat and pawn system can be deep and rewarding, but the hack and slash nature of melee classes or the rather dull amount of standing around as a mage and waiting for things to charge up for a minute can really make combat grow repetitive and boring quickly. Enemies can be way too spongy or just really hard to figure out how to damage, quest direction is often really vague, you have to walk far too long to get to quest and do so with far too little stamina, the escort missions are frustrating, the game really only saves at the end of long runs so you can easily do 5 or 6 things over the span of 30 minutes and then die before finding another place to save, and there are small quibbles like ugly animations and models and a lot of pop-in. Hard mode letting enemies randomly delete you out of nowhere just feels like the wrong end of the unpredictability curve that a lot of fights have. Dragon's Dogma can be pretty hardcore, and that naturally appeals to a smaller subset of players by default. Sometimes your pawn's AI does weird, stupid things, or the enemy gets a lucky shot that decimates your whole team, and other such oddities. But despite all these irritations, there is a lot to like about the game. A charm that pervades all, and you know, it's kind of an occupational hazard that combat can feel so unpredictable and exciting, and sometimes it just feels awful. <laughs> That's why I keep coming back to it. There's always a thrill to be had. There's a lot of heart here too, even if sometimes the execution is a little rough. The master works all, you can't go wrong. Now the future of Dragon's Dogma seems pretty bright with an upcoming sequel, and even back in 2012 the world was already clamoring for more. 2015 saw the much anticipated MMORPG called Dragon's Dogma Online, and this allowed traditional raid co-op. It had 1 million downloads in its first 10 days. The gameplay unfolds much in the way that the base game does, with many of the same vocations and pawns and abilities and enemies. The story is pretty cool actually and is a bit different from the established lore. It takes place in Lesitania or Lesitania, not Grancis, and features the player doing the bidding of a guardian white dragon who protects the land from the encroaching gold dragon. He's being kept alive through the protection of the masters, essentially Arisen, with whom he's imbued his power to protect the last remaining spark of his life in exchange for his knowledge and guidance. The Arisen in this game also are essentially being trained not to be God, but to become the new dragon should the previous one fall. Initially the game was to have five seasons, but they had to wrap up at three because the writing was on the wall for the game's longevity. 
In the first season, the Arisen fights off an evil alchemist who has resurrected the Golden Dragon, similar to how the Salvation Cult operated in Dragon's Dogma proper. The second season saw the Arisen purifying a plagued Great Tree and its compromised spirit within, and the third season sees the Arisen and the White Dragon, rallying the rest of the dragons together to beat the Black Dragon, and the Arisen is able to ascend to the White Dragonhood he's been preparing for. DDO looks and plays much like you'd expect it to, just in an MMO-centric structure. It was pretty popular, but unfortunately the game shut down in 2019 due to a dwindling player base. And I don't want to say I told you so, but the game never released outside of Japan, so I can't help but imagine that opening it up to the West would have improved its lifespan. But this wouldn't be the last new iteration that the series had. Five years later in 2020, a Dragon's Dogma anime dropped, proving that this year was indeed cursed on all fronts. It is unreal to me how silly this show is. The game's producer, Hiroyuki Kabayashi, produces here too, but it didn't seem to have a much good effect. For one, the animation is garish, being this hardcore committed 3D CGI looking shit for all the character models, so that the humans and monsters often emote with this VTuber doll look to them. Like this. Gregory also looks exceptionally plasticky for some reason. Now the voice acting's okay, but features some truly awful English accents, and there's no trace of the game's lovable medieval English dialect. Soldiers swear a lot, for instance, and Gregory, despite having David Lodge as a voice actor, isn't allowed to do that beautiful, crispy timber he did in the game, but Let's talk positively for a second. Ethan is our hero, an arisen whose family is murdered by Grigori and then vows revenge. He's the most comically ripped, self-righteously indignant blandoid main character, which is too bad because his voice actor has some talent. He's just not given anything to do other than be incredibly macho and angry. But hey, at least he's better than Capcom's other annoying Ethan. Ethan Winers, I mean Winters. <laughs> this is just too much. Oh, sorry. I said this was going to be more positive for a second. Let's get back to that. He's soon met by Hannah the Pawn, who's the best character in the show because she's a magic archer, but also because she's actually doing something cool from the games oftentimes. She says classic pawn shit like, survival is a natural compulsion. Hannah imbues Ethan with fire boons so he can kill the Cyclops. Hannah has to be protected so she can charge up her magic bow shot to kill the Griffin, while Ethan grabs hold and chops away. These are nice nods to the game. Beyond that, though, the anime tries too hard to be preachy or edgy. The Berserk manga and anime have been called misery porn before, and I feel like that's kind of what the Netflix show is trying to replicate, something that the game wisely avoided. There's lots of bloody violence, melodramatic moralizing, incredibly big breasts popping out all over the place, weird sex scenes that don't make anatomical sense, or just kind of look like grown men fondling Barbie dolls. I guess the show knew that it needed something to keep people's attention, but this is pretty low-hanging fruit. No pun intended. And as a boob man, it's very hard to complain about this, but yeah, this show doesn't have a whole lot going for it. It's kind targets women over all of us. Even the showdown with Grigori feels undercooked, like it's one of those conversations that aliens and humans have at the end of the invasion movie. You know, where the aliens are like, all you guys do is kill each other. You're not as evolved as we are. And then the person pleads with him, but we're trying. We can change. This whole scene at the end of the show misses the point of the dragon's subversive but positive role in the metaphor of the endless cycle of rebirth, and instead leans into reductive, bleeding heart sermons about moral relativity that think asking leading questions with no real answers is deeply edifying. Think Tarkovsky's stalker. Oh, shots fired. All that to say, for as strong a foundation as Dragon's Dogma started off with, the franchise has hit some lows with DDO unfortunately going offline despite being well-liked, and the rather uneven to terrible anime that feels like it's a bottled up LaCroix of Dragon's Dogma for Western consumption. But the good news is that the sequel comes out March 22nd, and I can already see stuff in this game that was missing from the last one, like the Beastron race, which this Kaji user will definitely gravitate towards. Uh, I see a new class in the Mystic Spear Hand, and there's some cool environmental manipulation that lets you set traps for the bad guys. And considering that there was a hang glider and, you know, a twice as big map and some other things that were cut in the final release of Dragon's Dogma that might appear here, I'm anxious to see, you know, how far they go. We might even get to the moon after all. In an era of terminally online cash grabs and sometimes a tedious amount of remakes and remasters, it's nice to see a sequel being made that looks like it might actually be an asset to enjoyment for longtime fans and not merely pandering to nostalgia. 
And judging by many people's lukewarm reaction to Starfield recently, including myself at first, I think we are in need of something a little bit more demanding, a little more engaging, that's not just a gratification simulator with very little friction that could possibly engage and reward us. It's easy to get spoiled by modern games that never ask very much of us, and just sort of get us high for a little bit, but never really elevate or surprise us much anymore. I know I've always heard that great art elevates you, it doesn't leave you in the same place as when you first started it. Dragon's Dogma was quite innovative for its genre and its time period, and if they can iron out the finicky bits and make travel less tedious or combat a little less repetitive, I think we can safely say that Arising Again is going to be a hell of a blast and a breath of fresh air. So I hope to see you all there as we celebrate the Year of the Dragon in style. Because remember, strength and numbers are risen. Strength and numbers are risen. Thanks for watching. Come again. And a huge shout out to those of you generous enough to support my work by subscribing to my Patreon. I have to thank Mark Newbauer, Dead Forge, Hey Blondie, He Act Show, and M for their contributions. And a special thanks to The Nth Review and James Wyatt for subscribing to my Patreon's highest tier. And many thanks again to James Baldy Wyatt's contributions to this video's writing in the vocations section. If you'd like to be part of the reason this channel gets bigger and better, feel free to go over to patreon.com forward slash high functioning medium, or you can become a YouTube channel member, or if you prefer, you can donate a code. Also check out my GOG and NordVPN affiliate links to contribute to the channel with no cost to you. God bless you everyone, and I'll see you soon.